Hello and welcome to the lecture for part two for chapter 13. In this section, I'm going to talk about dividends and uh, treasury stock primarily. So the first question is, why should corporations pay dividends at all? They're not legally required to pay dividends, except in the case of cumulative preferred stock. But other than that, there's no legal obligation for a company to pay dividends. A lot of companies, for example, Google, have not have never paid dividends. So when somebody invests in a company, invests in the stock of a corporation, they're hoping to get a return in one of two ways, either a share of the profits in the form of a dividend. That's kind of like earning interest on a savings account, right? It's some money that's coming back to you in return for your investment or they hope for appreciation for the stock. So they buy, buy the stock at one price, hold it for a period of time, and then sell it at a higher price. So some companies tout themselves as paying uh, robust dividends on a regular basis. So that can be a very good investment for somebody, say, that's retired that wants an income stream. And other companies like Google uh, say, no, we're going to invest our profits back in creating new products and making the company better. And that's going to cause the stock price to go up and you'll get appreciation. So it can be one of two ways. Generally, companies pay dividends because you'll remember when I mentioned earlier, the shareholders elect the board of directors, board of directors uh, hires the CEO. Well, the CEO wants to keep the shareholders happy. So making sure share prices are going up and making sure that the shareholders are receiving dividends are two ways to do that. So that starts with the board of directors authorizing the payment of the dividend by declaring the dividend. So that dividend can take the form of cash or stock. We'll talk about cash first and then stock. And the board is going to look to see, are, do we have sufficient retained earnings and sufficient cash on hand, if it's a cash dividend, to allow payment of the dividend? So is this a responsible thing to do or should the dividend be a little bit less and have the company hold a little bit more in reserve? So three dates are important from an accounting perspective. One is the date of declaration. That's the date that the board authorizes the dividend. The second date is the date of record. That's the date at which we say, we're gonna pay a dividend on the date of declaration. We say, we're gonna pay a dividend of a dollar per share to all shareholders as of a date in the future, maybe as of August 1st. Well, that's the date of record. That's the date at which we're gonna say, okay, people have been buying and selling the stock between each other. We're gonna take a snapshot of who owns it on August 1st. That's who's gonna get the check. And then later, it would be the date of payment. When do we actually mail the checks to the shareholders? So a cash dividend, and we'll assume here the board of directors declares the following dividend on October 1st, date of record, that means owners on November 1st, and the payment takes place December 2nd. So we'll look at the journal entries for this. We're talking about between preferred and common shares, 42,500 in dividends to be paid, cash. So when the dividend is declared, we'll debit an account called cash dividends. That's eventually going to get closed out at the end of the year. It's a temporary account. It'll get closed out to retained earnings. It's kind of like the drawing account for a sole proprietorship. So it has a normal debit balance. It's effectively a contra account within the equity section. So we'll debit that cash dividends account and we'll credit cash dividends payable, a current liability. On the date of record, there's no entry to be made. It's just we have to figure out who owns which shares. On the date of payment, then, we're just paying a current liability. So we debit that payable account and we credit cash, and then we're done. So at year end, again, I mentioned, we'll close out the cash dividends account to retain earnings. So cash dividend is an ec a stockholder's equity account. Now, sometimes companies are in a position where they don't have much cash on hand. Maybe they're in startup mode, but they want to reward their shareholders. And they can do that by issuing additional shares of stock. So they can give shareholders something of value that doesn't cost the company any money. So when this happens, there aren't, there's not a current liability. There's not any depletion of cash. It's really transferring a portion of our stockholders' equity from retained earnings to paid-in capital. 
So assume the board of directors declares a stock dividend of 100,000 shares. Those will be sent out pro rata to shareholders, so everybody's ownership interest stays the same. Kind of all boats rise the same percentage. So we're going to pay out a stock dividend of 100,000 shares to stockholders. Uh, on December 15th, we declare it to stockholders of record on the 31st of December, and we're going to distribute those shares on January 10th. We have to know the market value of the stock because the market value is the value that is being given to the shareholders. So that's what we're going to record it at. So we need to know the par value of the stock and the market value of the stock. In this case, market value is 31, par value is $20. So when the stock dividend is declared, we're going to debit stock dividends, which again is a temporary account that has a normal debit balance. We're going to do that for the number of shares times the value. That's the amount of value we've given the shareholders. We're then going to credit account called stock dividends distributable. That's going to also be within the equity section. It's kind of like stock dividend payable, but it's not in cash. And that's going to be for the par value of those shares. So in this case, it's the 100,000 shares times $20. And then we record some paid in capital and excess of par for the difference. At year end, we're going to close out stock dividends to retained earnings, and the stock dividends distributable and paid in capital in excess are reported in the paid in capital in excess portion or in the paid in capital section of the balance sheet. The next year, when we actually issue the shares, we're going to debit that stock dividends distributable account, and we're going to credit common stock. Remember in part one of this lecture, I talked about the fact that we're always going to credit common stock and preferred stock at par value. Well, that's why we had to credit stock dividends distributable at par value. When we clear that out, we want to record the entry at par value to common stock. So again, this doesn't change the total stockholders equity. It just reapportions it from retained earnings to paid in capital. The next thing I want to talk about is treasury stock. So that's stock that the company has issued at some point, and then they reacquire it. So they buy it back from shareholders. And they could do that for a variety of different reasons. They might want to provide those shares to employees for bonuses. They might want to allow employees to purchase those shares, that sort of thing, to have more employee ownership in the company. And they might want to raise the market price of the stock. And that's why you read in the paper about companies doing large stock buybacks. That's why they're doing it. And I'll explain that because it's a little bit confusing. So the market price of a company, the value of the total company, okay, is the market price times the number of shares. That's what investors value the entire company at. That value really has more to do with um, expectations, investors' expectations of what's going to happen in the future for that company. How are they going to grow? What are future for profits going to be? That really establishes the price of the stock. It's not how much cash they have in the bank. So the market price of the stock is the value of the company in total divided by the number of shares. That gives you a price per share. Well, if we have a couple million dollars sitting in the bank that we don't have any current need for, we could take a chunk of that money and go out on the market and buy shares of stock at market price back from shareholders. That's going to reduce the denominator. It's going to reduce the number of shares that are outstanding, but it's not really going to have any impact on the overall market value of the company. So you're going to be taking the same market value and dividing it by a lower number of shares, which means the stock price goes up. I remember when I mentioned that CEOs want owners to be happy with the company. Well, one way to do that is by having the share price go up. So that's why companies do that. The argument against doing it is there's no real economic gain experienced when that happens. But in any event, that's why it does happen. So the treasury stock account has a normal debit balance. It's a contra account within the stockholders equity section of the balance sheet. And we use the cost method for treasury stock. So you can, for treasury stock transactions, you can forget about par value at this point. We're going to record treasury stock at what we pay for it. And if we later reissue it or resell it, we'll recognize a gain or a loss based on what we sell it for later and what we paid for it to begin with. So it helps to look at some journal entries here. 
So let's say on February 13th, we purchase 1,000 shares of Treasury stock at $45 per share. So we'll use the cost method, we'll debit Treasury stock, and again, that's its normal balance for 45,000, and we'll credit cash for 45,000. And we can ignore the par value. Now assume that on April 29th, we sell 600 shares of the Treasury stock for $60. So we get 36,000 in cash. Here's the important part. We debited Treasury stock at a lower amount, we debited Treasury stock at $45 per share. So it went into that Treasury stock at 45. It has to come out at 45 or we'd end up with some weird residual when we sold all of it. So I'm gonna credit Treasury stock for 600 shares times $45 or 27,000. That'll create paid in capital from sale of Treasury stock. That's in effect the gain from reselling our own stock. So if we have gains or losses from selling our own stock, those gains or losses won't be on the income statement. They'll be in the equity section of the balance sheet as additional paid in capital or paid in capital from the sale of Treasury stock. So I want to show you a couple of different stockholders equity sections. There's two different ways to do it. So in this case here, we look at the stock by class. So we show preferred stock. And again, it's going to include some detailed information about how many shares are uh, outstanding and how many shares are authorized and issued that sort of thing, what the par value is, what the, uh, this is a 10% dividend uh, for the preferred stock. And then we're gonna show the uh, paid in capital in excess right after that. So we see a total of 110,000 of paid in capital for preferred. And then we do the same thing for common stock, provide the details listed at par, and then show the excess price over par. So we have total paid in capital, and then you see we've got some gain from the sale of treasury stock. That's our total paid in capital. Then we have our retained earnings. Those are earnings, again, that have not been paid out as dividends yet. And then we subtract the treasury stock from that to get our net stockholders equity. The other way to do it is really just uh, group it differently. Oh, I, I apologize. I'm showing you a retained earnings statement here. I'm sorry. So we can do a retained earnings statement, which just reconciles the retained earnings of the company. So showing their net income, less any dividends that are paid, giving us uh, ending retained earnings. We're allowed to do this kind of statement if there aren't any stock transactions that were done during the period. So if there were some stock transactions done during the period, we would do a recap as you see here. So hopefully that makes sense. If not, as always, please contact me by email and I'm happy to either answer your question by email or set up a time when we can talk over Zoom. Thank you very much, and I look forward to talking to you when we start on Chapter 14. Thank you.